meetings um, where we will talk about um, data collection um, in, in the juvenile justice system in Michigan before uh, next month's meeting where we turn to some presentation of findings where we will share key takeaways and findings from our analysis of juvenile justice data and findings from our qualitative assessment, our focus groups and interviews. So um, we wanted to have this conversation about data um, to highlight um, kind of the challenges and limitations and opportunities for improvement with regard to data collection, but also to set the expectations for our next couple of presentations to share with you all um, the data that we were able to access for this assessment, as well as um, what are the key questions that we will be able to answer over the course of the next two uh, presentations. Um, and it'll include a discussion first um, from Terry Gilbert, who will present an overview from the work that she and others have done in Michigan, who have a much more intimate knowledge with data collection than, than we do, having just come in over the last several months. Um, we'll share more information about the data for the assessment. And then we'll also share kind of like in the finance meeting that we had last month, some best practice examples from other states that are similarly situated as Michigan and how they've been able to create robust statewide data systems um, and what their best practices uh, look like that potentially could be used for, uh, for Michigan's recommendations. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to turn it over to the Lieutenant Governor um, for any kind of introductory remarks that you might wanna share before we get started. Nina, thank you so much. Good morning, everyone. I thank you. Just, I'm really glad to be here participating with you. Uh, my background is a little more interesting. I'm over here looking at Lake Superior. I'm in Escanaba and I'm in a vehicle where I knew I would have trustworthy uh, cell phone service. So uh, just to give you some context as to what I'm doing here. I just want to thank everybody for their commitment to this cause. Um, this is going to take a lot of time. It already has taken a lot of time, a lot of labor a lot of brain power, um, but it's gonna make Michigan better. This is a system that is so crucial to making sure that young people and families can be positioned for success. So thank you for your commitment to that. Uh, when I was uh, humbled to be elected Lieutenant Governor of the state, I made it clear that I would focus on reforming our justice system uh, so that it could again, position people to be successful and to be their best selves. Uh, there have been a lot of elements of that work. Uh, certainly, folks may be aware of the, the, the work done on jail and pretrial incarceration through a task force that reviewed Michigan's jail and court data and made recommendations about how to expand alternatives to jail, safely reduce jail admissions, length of stay, and improve effectiveness on that front end of the justice system. And that work did pay off. We have seen bipartisan packages of bills reforming sentencing guidelines and police, policing practices to reduce jail time, to increase the use of tickets and citations rather than arrest that leads to incarceration, uh, reduce the set of offenses that lead to suspended driver's licenses, and much more. With this task force, we're even further upstream. This is like, if that was the front end, this is the front end of the front end of our justice system. And so we have a chance now with this work to sustain and build on the momentum of earlier initiatives. So really there's a few things that I wanna you to keep in mind as we continue the work and it's an important conversation today. I want to emphasize how important the working groups are. Through these working groups, we're gonna actually identify the solutions and recommendations that we can take to policymakers, including our policymakers. I wanna thank our legislators and our, and our judges and, and those uh, on this call in the administration and their colleagues in the legislature. We're gonna examine data, the data that we're gonna be talking about from the systems that we're talking about today the research, the best practices that we've been hearing about in these meetings thus far, that really will enable us to transform our juvenile justice system and make it work for people all across the state of Michigan. And we know that it hasn't always met that mark. I mean, there's this report that just came out in the last couple of days about the work that still needs to be done in Michigan. And this task force, it's timely and important because we're the body that's gonna make that progress. Now, data collection is another important part of what we're doing here. And we're gonna talk a lot about that today. As we go about our work, we have to be aggressive when it comes to learning as much as we can. We know that just as the large systemic view of our juvenile justice system is important, so is that of the people, of the individuals who are moving through the system. So that's like a reflection of that philosophy. We're gathering quantitative data 
and supplementing that, supplementing it with qualitative data if Nina just described. We're gonna dive into that a little more in this meeting. Now, we also know that we're not gonna be able to answer every question. And I really wanna hone in on that. There are so many important questions and so many important facets to the questions into our system that we want in our heart of hearts to understand so we can analyze and improve. We're working with imperfect systems. We're working with some you know, limited resources. And so we're really gonna make, need to make sure that this group and our working groups are focusing on what are those key questions that we know that we have a path to being able to understand and answer so we can make progress in those areas. Even with those limitations, this is an unprecedented analysis of Michigan's juvenile justice system. We're gonna be able to gain a lot of insight into those key questions. And also that's gonna allow us to make better informed recommendations about how to better serve children and families who've been involved or in contact with our juvenile justice system. Now, finally, as you all are taking part in these working groups, just continue to think big picture. This is what's gonna create really wide ranging beneficial systematic change. This is not the time to think inside of a small box. Ask yourselves, what does that ideal justice system look like? How does it work? How do we get there from where we are right now? This is the time to think creative, the time to think with an innovative mindset. And what is something being innovative? What does that mean? It means a mindset that creates a system that is different, that's better, that works for more people. This is the time to go both tinkering around the edges, implementing things in the central systemic reforms, but also just anything with an eye toward improving those outcomes for our young people. It's gonna make the system more efficient and effective. I am so confident and thankful uh, to all of you who have stepped up to be part of this task force. We can and will get this done and it will make a difference for the people who we serve. So thank you all once again for being part of it. And Nina, I will pass it back to you. Great, thank you, Lieutenant Governor. I think that was perfect context in setting the stage for, for this conversation and kind of leading into the charge ahead after this meeting, um, going into the working groups and the, the findings presentation. So thank you so much for that. Um, before we get into the, the meat of the, the conversation today around data, I did wanna share a brief status update about the work that um, we have been doing over the last several months in partnership with, with many of you um, on this initiative and, and on this assessment. Um, so uh, over the last couple of months, um, as many of you know, we've been engaging in focus groups and interviews with stakeholders across the juvenile justice system and across the state. And, and many of you have been very um, helpful in connecting us with the right people and making sure that we're covering um, you know, the, the stakeholders that we need to talk to in, in terms of geography and perspective. Um, but we've had focus group with various juvenile court officials, behavioral health leaders, law enforcement, um, probation, um, providers, detention, obviously state agency staff and leadership. Um, and we're continuing to have those conversations over the next uh, couple of weeks as well, leading into our February um, task force meeting. Um, additionally, we're in the process of establishing a series of listening sessions with youth and families who have experienced the juvenile justice system, who are most impacted by the policies and practices in the juvenile justice system. We're working closely with our advocates advisory board and community-based providers to help identify and prep young people and, and their families to participate in these listening sessions. Um, we'll have more information to share about that shortly, but we're planning on hosting at least three or four of those listening sessions in March. And we plan to invite task force members to participate in those listening sessions. Um, we think it's really important for, for you all to be able to hear directly from young people and families about the impact um, of their experiences, as well as the recommendations that they might have to transform and change the juvenile justice system. Um, these will take place virtually, and, and obviously we'll share that information in terms of dates and times ahead of time, and more information as we get closer, but we are in the process of establishing those, those listening sessions. Um, additionally, we've established uh, a tribal advisory board. Um, we've had the assistance of the Michigan Indian Judges Association and others to put that together. Um, we've met a couple of times with that tribal advisory board to just learn more contextually about the intersectionality, um, the connections and collaboration um, between tribal justice systems and the state and local juvenile justice systems in Michigan. 
They are also helping us facilitate focus groups with um, other tribal uh, leaders um, and stakeholders within their communities, including youth and families. So that will take place as well over the next several weeks. Um, and as I mentioned, we've met uh, a number of times with our advocates advisory board to, to help with facilitating those, those listening sessions. Um, additionally, SCAO's judicial working group has been meeting um, very diligently um, every couple of weeks. Um, and I know that, that Tom and others will, will probably share some of their reactions to the data presentation, given that the last meeting focused heavily on uh, challenges, limitations, fears, and opportunities around collecting uh, more juvenile justice data in the state. And then the last thing I'll share about kind of the work that we've been doing over the last several weeks is putting together these uh, issue specific working groups that the Lieutenant Governor mentioned. Um, and I think we talked briefly about at our last meeting. Um, we are establishing uh, five different uh, issue specific working groups that will be responsible for diving deeper into our assessment findings, learning and looking at best practices and national research um, what has worked in other jurisdictions to address similar challenges um, and, and, and make improvements in their juvenile justice systems. And they will ultimately be responsible for identifying recommendations that will be presented to this task force for potential approval, um, inclusion in a final report and potential legislative, administrative and, and funding changes. Those working groups will begin meeting in February. The finance working group has already started meeting. I think they had one meeting a couple of weeks ago to, to set the context after the finance uh, focused task force meeting. Um, and we will be uh, starting the other working groups in the next several weeks. And we've been working with many of you all to try and identify participants. Um, we want to make sure there's diversity in geography, perspective, that people on these working groups are actually folks that would be responsible um, for implementing the policy changes that might be resulting from this task force. Um, some folks that are more directly working within the juvenile justice system, as well as people that might have a broader perspective. Um, and so in addition to finance, there will be a, a data working group coming out of this meeting. And then there will be a working group focused on diversion, one focused on court processes and disposition, and one focused on out of home placement. Um, and so uh, as we get closer to finalizing those lists, um, if anybody has additional recommendations or nominations, we're, we're still taking them. There's a few gaps that we're trying to fill in each of those working groups, um, uh, but we are, are planning on sending out more information, overviews of those working groups, list of participants, so that we can uh, schedule first meetings for those groups um, in February. Um, so I wanna just pause there before we get into the data conversation, see if anyone has any questions about process, um, any other recommendations for information gathering that we, um, we could use uh, leaning into our first presentation of findings. Um, and then I'll, I'll turn it over to Terry for the, the presentation. But any, any questions just about process, anything that I might have missed, um, Stephanie, Josh, Jacob, and others? Um, I think I just want to add that as um, we start to shift into the um, presentation of our findings and the working groups are meeting and folks are thinking about the working groups and the Lieutenant Governor's encouragement for everyone to, to think big picture about policy change, funding change, administrative change. I know that that can feel intimidating um, and just wanna share with folks as you begin thinking about those changes, um, what we have seen from other states and, and when we've directly supported states, um, for many of those big changes, there is a planning and implementation period that is often 12 months, that can be as long as 18 months or even 24 months um, for um, the policy practice development, the capacity building, the local readiness needed to implement those changes. Um, and I just thought that that's important to provide that now because sometimes um, the questions that come up or the hesitations that come up when we're thinking about big changes is how, how are we going to change the system like this um, so quickly? Uh, how are individual counties going to prepare for those changes? Um, and so just as we think about potential changes, 
we can also think about the timeline that's needed to ensure that the policies, the, the implementation considerations, the data infrastructure comes along with those changes. So um, it's not like legislation gets adopted and then all of those changes uh, hit on, on the next day. Um, so just encouraging folks to think big picture, but also to think about timelines and planning processes that might be needed to ensure that any system changes really can be implemented effectively. Uh, if there's no uh, questions about process, and, and we can talk about it at the end as well when we get into next steps, um, we're going to get into our, our data collection conversation. I'm going to turn it over to Terry Gilbert from Wayne State University, who I know many of you have uh, have known for many years um, uh, in working in, in juvenile justice in the state of Michigan, who's going to provide an overview um, of uh, data collection on juvenile justice in Michigan. Um, what are the challenges? What are the limitations? And where there are opportunities for improvement? So Terry, um, take it away. Thanks very much, Nina. Thank you, everyone. I'm very honored to be here this morning. and very pleased to talk with you about juvenile justice data specifically. Uh, my colleague, Joe Ryan, and I have worked with juvenile justice data for many years. Unfortunately, Joe isn't able to be with us this morning. He was called to an emergency meeting by the provost of the University of Michigan, so he had to go do that right now. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I've worked in child welfare, juvenile justice, and mental health programming since 1979. Um, I've been involved in juvenile justice from the county level, being uh, an executive director of one of the care management organizations, and on the ground floor of the creation of Wayne County's juvenile justice managed care system. I then went to the state of Michigan and I was the bureau director for Child Welfare Bureau under the Grand Home Administration, and then uh, bureau director for Child Welfare Funding and Juvenile Justice under the Snyder Administration. So in all of those positions, I learned the importance of data for being able to keep track of the programs I was managing and being able to see what was happening in those programs. I never started out to be a data geek, but I learned the importance of data through managing large complex systems. In the child welfare system, for example, the state was unable to defend itself effectively against the child welfare consent decree because it didn't have comprehensive data reporting. So under my bureau administration, we created what's called the data management unit. And that unit produces regular reports, internal and external for managing and monitoring the child welfare system. And that's really what is needed in the juvenile justice system as well. I heard you mention earlier that there are some hesitation about producing data and looking at data. Believe me, there was a lot of hesitation in producing and looking at child welfare data. So that's not a new response to looking at large data sets and managing a system using data, but it's also effective because we couldn't have improved the child welfare system without monitoring the data. So today I wanna to talk to you specifically about uh, juvenile justice data. Let me share my screen. Oh, two monitors is so fun. Uh, come on. Okay. Do you see the juvenile justice data landscape uh, on your screen? Yes. Someone tell me yes or no. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> you uh, don't get to see what the folks see when you're using Zoom, you only see your own screen. Um, the report we're gonna, what was the impetus for this report is um, a commission from uh, the Public Welfare Foundation to create a report that provided the general public and stakeholders an overview of the criminal legal system in Michigan. We, uh, they commissioned us to describe and explain both the adult criminal justice system and the youth justice system. Our um, goals were to provide an overview of what we know and what we don't know about the entire criminal legal system in Michigan. 
In the youth section, we researched uh, and completed that using available data. So we used publicly available data, but we also used data from the uh, Judicial Data Warehouse, which is um, kept at the State Court Administrative Office. We used Michigan State Police data to look at adult arrests because we're unable to look at juvenile arrests. And we were able to look at um, child welfare data from the MISACWA system at the Michigan Department of Human Services to look at youth who had their origins in the child welfare system. And we were able to determine there was about a 60% overlap. But today I wanna to talk with you about what we know and importantly, what we don't know. What we learned through looking at these various data sets is that the most basic questions pertaining to youth justice in Michigan remain largely unanswered. So questions such as I've listed here, we really could not answer and we couldn't describe the extent to which we know the answers to these questions. It's really important as a system to be able to answer these questions. We need to know, has offending changed over time? Uh, is the system equitable and fair or are there disparities at key decision points? We need to know which programs are achieving positive outcomes. Where are these programs located? Can they be replicated successfully in other geographic areas? And fundamentally, we don't know how much the taxpayers spend on youth justice. The Lieutenant Governor mentioned that we really look at data as a view of the people. And it's important to remember that when we're looking at data, data are people and we want to deliver the best juvenile justice system that's available. When we tried to gather data for this report, we discovered, uncovered, we knew a lot of this, that there were a lot of flaws in available data. And I have to say those flaws exist at macro level data, state level data, but also in county level data. So these are some things to keep in mind as we begin to collect and analyze data in the juvenile justice system. The reliability and integrity of any data reporting depends on what is in the data systems. Some data systems collect data that others don't. Some data systems define their data differently, so they think they're collecting the same data. In actuality, when you do a deep dive into that data, it's different. Um, the definitions are not all standardized across the juvenile justice system, and everyone doesn't participate in collecting and reporting data. So those were some of the fundamental flaws that we found. And in some instances, there simply was no state aggregate data available. Therefore, we relied on federal data, for example, we had to rely on the OJJDP census of juveniles in residential placement to give us compiled data about who is in residential placement, how long do they stay, what do those youth look like. Now, that's a seriously flawed data set because that data is collected through direct contact from the Office of Juvenile Justice, Delinquency and Prevention to a residential or detention facility once a year. It's a point in time that then gets extrapolated, but it's the only data we have available. So that's the data we reported with caveats. Even statewide compiled data, such as arrest data that we were able to get from the MICR data set at the Michigan State Police has to be interpreted with caution because some jurisdictions report arrest data differently than other jurisdictions. And there's variation in policing practices across all the jurisdictions that report data. So the data we have must be viewed with caution. Um, go. Here's an example in a delinquency case filing trend graph. This data was compiled from the State Court Administrative Office annual caseload reports. And we compiled the data and trended it over time. And we were able to see at a large scale level that juvenile justice case filings are down 
pretty significantly, overall 38%. We were also able to see how many uh, adjudications are pending, how many are supervised by the court versus the department, DHS, versus DCJ, which is the Wayne County system. But that's about all we can conclude from this graph because courts report consent calendar differently. Not all of them report consent calendar. Courts report diversion differently. Not all of them report diversion. So we were only able to make very broad scale conclusions. Oops, sorry about this data. Um, the report therefore, identified opportunities for what we can do in the juvenile justice system. Reading the report, readers no doubt noted that there are significant gaps in our knowledge base around the youth justice system in Michigan. Maybe not in their own court, maybe not in their own county, they may have a very good grasp of what's going on locally, but across the system as a whole, we don't have a good idea of what the system looks like. Michigan courts collect a wealth of information on adolescents and families associated with the youth justice system or who touch the justice system in some way. But unfortunately, these data aren't organized and utilized in a manner that helps facilitate maximum value. Consequently, courts and the state achieve only a basic, maybe even a biased understanding of how the youth justice system operates. It's our hope that this report the Public Welfare Report on the Criminal Justice System in Michigan is the beginning of a longer conversation about juvenile justice in Michigan. And it sounds like from the Lieutenant Governor, that's exactly what this task force is setting out to do. It's a good idea to know where we are today and where our stakeholders would like it to evolve in the future. So we hope that this presentation and this report encourages you across the system to ask questions and to embark on a meaningful dialogue around the effectiveness of the system because it touches the lives of numerous youth and families. Why on earth would you want to use data? There's always a hesitation in any industry, in any nonprofit, in any human services system about using data. But the juvenile justice system should be designed to provide services in the least restrictive environment possible, that simultaneously protects public safety and supports the developmental gains of the youth involved in the system. These services should be evidence-based, focused on cost-effective and safe alternatives to incarceration. Because the youth justice system in Michigan is decentralized and aggregate data reporting on key indicators doesn't really exist, we've had to rely on self-report, anecdotal evidence, and other means to determine whether the system meets those expected standards. So at the state level, why would you want to collect data? So that we can answer basic questions about the system. And these questions may come from researchers, from professionals, from stakeholders, from citizens and taxpayers, and the youth and families themselves. It's also used to advocate for funding. The Office of Juvenile Justice um, Prevention Program issues grants every year to states millions of dollars that because we don't have compiled aggregate data in Michigan, we're unable to respond to those requests for proposals in a very thorough manner. And also having state level data helps us identify and support policy priorities. When Raise the Age legislation was issued, we were really unable to respond to that effectively because we didn't really know how much have we spent, how many youth are likely to come into the system, what happens to 17 year olds now versus what will happen to them when they become part of the juvenile justice system. So we had to approximate data uh, at uh, the Child and Adolescent Data Lab, Joe and I worked with the people who were trying to submit the report on the um, Raise the Age, and it was extremely challenging because we didn't have good aggregate data. So having data available at a state level supports positive changes, it counters negative publicity, and it informs citizens and taxpayers what's happening in their state. It's a basic requirement of all systems that touch children and families. Why use county level data? At the county level, 
we know that making good decisions can be informed by having the data, understanding the data. It's impossible to know whether policies or practices that you've implemented in your county are resulting in positive outcomes without collecting and analyzing the data. You need to know what is working, what isn't working. This knowledge helps you improve the system in your county um, and, and helps you be able to deliver the most effective services to the youth. Counties can use data to promote the good programs that they're offering and to promote the quality of life in their county. It can be used to support funding for the most effective interventions and bring about changes when something isn't working. Judges use data to align their decisions in court with evidence-based practices to support positive outcomes for kids and identify opportunities for improvement. It also helps judges, elected officials, county officials to educate the community to better understand what issues and changes they see every day in their courtroom. What are the kinds of kids that are appearing before you? Is there a trend? What are the issues that they're bringing to court? What kinds of offenses have they committed? What are the challenges they're facing? Those are all things that you can know through data and you can know it objectively rather than thinking of these cases that I've heard look like this. The data tells you exactly what you've been seeing in your court. And that's, you can share that with the community to allow the community to actually help improve the juvenile justice system. Data helps local counties and courts answer important questions of their constituents, of the state, of the media, such as, is juvenile crime really going up? How many kids are coming to the attention of the court for gun offenses? Right now, people are having this feeling that violent crime has increased a lot. Has it? The data will tell us. But what data? We can't really use arrest data necessarily. We need to look at how many youth are adjudicated for such crimes. So the data at the county level helps you understand which interventions are effective, advocate for funding, and answer some fundamental questions about what's happening in the juvenile justice system in your community. There are several barriers to data integration and data reporting. There are four primary challenges. The Pew um, Foundation identified that state governments encounter four challenges when it comes to using data to improve public policy. These challenges apply equally to Michigan's youth justice system. The first challenge is human capital or staffing. A lack of human capital, people with technical expertise, um, a lack of staff who can do data entry, who can run data reports and interpret data reports is usually one of the primary challenges. But this could be overcome with strategic partnerships, uh, many of which already exist, um, having partnerships with data scientists, with universities, with state departments that have staffing to be able to do this. There are some creative ways that we can look at the human capital issue. The other three obstacles are data accessibility. In other words, is this data available in some central location so that we can obtain the data, so that we can pull out the data that we're collecting? A lot of systems are unable to retrieve data. The other issue is data quality in that are the definitions standard uh, between and across systems? Do we collect data in the same way? Um, no mechanism of quality assurance is in place right now to ensure that we are all defining these data points the same way. And then finally, there are um, data sharing barriers, and that is who can see data? When can they see data? How is the data checked for accuracy before being shared? Um, what kinds of data use agreements exist around the data? And finally, there are incentives. Right now, there are really no incentives to gathering and reporting and sharing data. So those are some things that we need to think about in terms of moving forward with data reporting. Nina asked me to cover potential next steps. When I um, think about building uh, data management and aggregate data reporting, I think of it like a roadmap. 
And indeed, there is another group that's working on a blueprint toward uh, data integration and data sharing. And the first thing, of course, is to create a governance structure so that you know who is uh, at the top of the triangle, who can make decisions, who can leverage resources and provide funding. Then, and it sounds like you're doing this, generally you conduct an environmental scan. Who is doing what and who has what data? Once you put that together, you can develop a gap analysis. Okay, 50 counties are collecting this data, the rest are not collecting this data, and then you put that into a gap analysis to see where do you need to start with data collection. Of course, the information technology architecture needs to be determined. What do I mean by architecture? Information architecture is sort of how the system is built. At the state, the data architecture is the state data warehouse. The state data warehouse, if you imagine it looks like a pie, and in that pie, there are slices of data that belong to the various state departments. The judicial data warehouse is one slice of that pie. But there are other pieces of the pie. For example, Michigan Department of Health and Human Services child welfare data is in the data warehouse. So that's another piece of the pie. So we have the information architecture within the state of Michigan, but how do we leverage that on a local level? That's something that the committee is gonna to need to take a look at. Then we need to determine the data requirements. So if we want to report on specific issues, what data is going to be required? After you know what data fields are required, then we need to develop data standardization. That is, how do we define this data? How do we collect and report it on a, a specific, regular, and standard basis? Let me give you an example from my own past where we didn't think about that. When I was at DHHS in child welfare, we developed a data sharing agreement with the State Court Administrative Office for child welfare data. This came about because SCAO would issue their annual report on child welfare and the department would issue a report on child welfare and the numbers weren't agreeing. So we did a data sharing agreement so that SCAO and child welfare data could be merged and we could make sure we were reporting like numbers. Our adoption numbers were always off. It didn't make any sense to us. DHS would report a certain number of adoptions. The Supreme Court would report a certain number of adoptions and they didn't agree. So we had to sit down and literally take apart piece by piece what we meant by adoptions. It turns out that when the courts report an adoption was one date and when DHS reported an adoption was another date. So as we were doing year end reports, the date differences made a difference in the numbers. So you don't think about that when you think about data standardization, but it was a key point that we didn't get to until we got down into the weeds on that data element. And then we need to develop a regular set of reports. Of course, there are internal reports, internal to the system to help manage and improve the system. And then there are public facing reports to let the citizens, the taxpayers, the youth and families know what's happening in the system. Concurrent with this, there needs to be a determination of data sharing parameters. What are the policies around data sharing? Who has access, when, where, how? What about liability? How do we cover the fact that once a report is out there, there may be some liability incurred for the results of that report? That needs to be thought of carefully. And then of course, data use agreements need to be structured with everybody who's looking at and using data. We do have some progress so far. We're not starting from scratch. There are several groups meeting in multiple forums about what to do about data. Uh, in 2020, there was the Michigan, uh, the Michigan Justice Fund supported a data work group that's ongoing right now that's trying to create a blueprint to move data integration forward. Um, previous to that, oops, sorry, <laughs> okay technical difficulties here. Um, previous to that, there was a, a, a work group that was um, working with the Michigan Justice Fund and the Safety and Justice Roundtable, and they issued recommendations for data integration and sharing 
In 2018, there was a juvenile justice data dictionary issued by Juvenile Justice 2020. In 2013, a multi-jurisdictional juvenile justice data sharing project was, was launched, which is still in process today. In 2012, there was a large convening that we uh, lightly called Data Palooza. We brought together over 50 people to talk about how do we share data across jurisdictions. So there have been a lot of things started. We just haven't gotten over the hump to be able to actually share the data. There are lots of resources for this uh, at the national level on how to share data, how to define data, and indeed there are some data sharing uh, and data definitions that have already been done at the national level. So we're not starting from scratch. So um, I say all of this to say that data sharing is not impossible. It's extremely important. And I encourage you as you go forward to talk about this issue. Um, I'm always available to help. And uh, I've looked at juvenile justice data, as I said, since about 1979. So um, I'm happy to answer any questions at this point that anybody might have. Thanks, Terry. And, and yeah, I had asked um, for that kind of last slide around next steps and opportunities, because I think that serves as a really good foundation for what the data working group will start thinking about as it as it starts developing recommendations for how to improve uh, data collection in Michigan and um, what are the steps that they might want to take what what questions will they want to wrestle with so that was really really helpful in kind of setting the context for for that next step um, yeah I, I want to open it up for for questions um, for Terry um, and then also have an opportunity for um, folks from SCAO and, and, and Derek and others from DHHS as well to provide reactions, given that I know they, they house a lot of the juvenile justice data and probably have some, some comments um, about some of the flaws and challenges that they've experienced in trying to collect and, and utilize that data. But first, uh, Representative Leitner. Thank you. And thank you uh, for all that information, Terry. I've um, worked with Dr. Kubiak from Wayne State quite a bit. Um, so I guess one of my questions is when you ha uh, were compiling this information, you know, I see that you mentioned different groups, different projects, different work groups. Is there actually at some point a real coming together of all the groups to share this so they're not always reinventing the wheel and seeing what the problem is in each, each little silo? Because, you know, for me, you know, I come from the county as well, um, and then went into the state legislature, and I feel like a lot of people just stay in their own silo, and I just don't know how you go about an actual coming together of these groups with all these super smart people that can guide people like us that actually, um, you know, pass the laws to fix some of these things or make them better or, you know, have continuity across the state. Is there something like that, some big shebang where we they can all get together at the same time? There is not now, but there certainly could be. It's not impossible to do. Um, we need to have strong governance and leadership to make that happen to somebody who can say, everyone come to the table and let's work on this. Um, when we did Data Palooza in uh, 2012, we did have people across jurisdictions. We had mental health, we had education, we had state police, we had all of the jurisdictions or all of the multidisciplinary professions that touch the juvenile justice population. And we started down a path, unfortunately, with changes in leadership at state government, uh, we didn't go anywhere. Um, there was no enabling legislation. There wasn't anything to sustain that effort moving forward. When the state CIO left, the project uh, left as well. Um, so I, I'm a firm believer that those who don't remember history are doomed to repeat it, which is why I always include the historical perspective and what's been done before. But it's not impossible to do, and it would be a really great thing for the state to embark on. And I think that the working group that we're establishing is, is the start of that and bringing people together. And I think one of the things that they can think about, and, and we've seen this happen in other states as a result of this process, um, and, and as Terry mentioned, codified in statute is the requirement around the development of a comprehensive data plan, data oversight and accountability structure 
that um, has some teeth to it. Um, and that can be something that the working group thinks about how it might recommend for this task force to move forward with something like that um, in a recommendation. I would like to make one last uh, comment about this before uh, we address Judge Allen's question. And that is that sometimes it's very frustrating to have a number of social workers and lawyers in a room trying to solve an IT problem. So I highly recommend that you also invite IT professionals who understand data architecture and understand data merging. Great. Yeah. And, and one other thing, just so folks know, you know, we've been working um, closely with Terry and, and, and Joe Ryan to make sure that all the work that they've been doing under this report and with public welfare, that we're aligning, we're not duplicating efforts, we're trying to merge so that there is that unified approach to, to thinking about juvenile justice data. Um, Judge Allen. Thank you. I just wanted to say thank you for the presentation. Very well done. And um, it, it is important that we get the historical perspective because we don't want to have to re, uh, redo uh, what has already been done. And it's, it's, an important, it's an important lesson that you highlighted. And um, in, in working with this topic, it, I know it's frustrating. It's, it is um, something that um, people resist. I am curious though, just as a specific question, what are some of the examples of incentives for data reporting? Mm. If you can uh, highlight mm. that. <laughs> I, I, as that as a judge, so I, I would like to know what will incentivize, um, you know. <laughs> I think that's something that the committee writ large definitely needs to think about. What do incentives look like? Because if there are only disincentives to collecting data, like, right. oh, I got to hire more staff, I need to buy more equipment, that's not helpful. That doesn't encourage people. So maybe an incentive can be you get a little bit higher reimbursement. Oh, they're going to kill me. You get a little higher reimbursement on child care fund if you'll do this kind of data reporting or, or something. I don't know where we have leverage to do incentives, but there needs to be some kind of encouragement to be able to collect and report data. Maybe it's to advocate for better funding for specific programs. I believe the program in my county is the best there is. I'm going to collect data and I can go advocate for more funding or a statewide presence of this program. There are various sort of levels of incentives, but I do challenge this committee to think about that because without incentives, it's kind of hard to say you have to do this. I wonder, um, it, and now this is this is getting into the weeds a little bit. It's child protection, but when we went into uh, Title IV E funding, and that was a massive change all the way around, legislatively, uh, certainly for the judiciary. But the incentive on that was, um, you know, funding that came from the federal system into the counties, and it would seem to me that that is the ultimate type of incentive. You know. You could definitely look to BJA or OJJDP to find out what funding might be available to help incentivize or at least get started on this kind of an effort. Unfortunately, as you know, there's no federal statutory funding for juvenile justice. Correct. <laughs> but thank you. Great presentation. Thank you. Commissioner Webster. Well, I, I hope I'm not just stating the obvious. It seems really obvious to me that um, if the number one barrier to collecting data is staff and tech, technical expertise, and then funding. anything, yeah, yes, funding for staff and technical expertise, then the number one thing we have to think about when talking about data collection is how are we going to fund that for county at the county level? Because as a county commissioner, I can already hear our court staff saying, you're asking for this something again that is unfunded. Um, and if we're going to have a comprehensive statewide system with everybody reporting, that has to be a, a very high priority in funding, it seems to me. You're absolutely correct, Commissioner, that we do have to adequately fund this. How we fund it is a challenge up to the work group to try to think about. But additional staff, additional IT equipment, you know, uh, software needs to be funded so that this can be done. And that's always been a barrier. 
I think also, and we'll share a little bit in the state examples later, it's, it's also how can the state provide technical assistance and capacity building support to county level folks who are working in data. So yes, it's having the staff, but it's also, you might have staff that could just use some of that technical support um, from a state body. And we've seen other states operate or, or do that in, in that way as well. Um, in addition to the, the analytic capacity at the local level. Commissioner Bell. Thank you. Uh, the previous commissioner uh, touched on what I was going to speak on as far as funding. Um, as you all know, in Wayne County, we do use a CMO system and part of their contractual obligation to us is to provide data and provide us with a report every um, year over the different CMOs that we use, Black Family Development, uh, Starfish, et cetera. So um, I think it's important that across the state that we look at funding for the IT professionals and the staff that's going to be performing this data collection um, if you don't already collect it um, like we do already. So I just wanted to uh, put an exclamation point on the funding and using the state for the technical assistance to um, help counties who uh, do need that assistance with that data collection. But great presentation and I look forward to uh, getting more information across the other counties throughout the state and how they provide their data and how they upload their data from their county to the state. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Bell. I'm very familiar with the, with the county data collected in Wayne and it's one of the most robust and thorough data sets I've ever worked with. And that's because of the, their contract for them to do that. <laughs> so the <laughs> providers have to do that in order to get funding in order for us to uh, contract with them. So thank you for that. Thank you for your presentation. <laughs> sure. Senator Lasada. Yeah, thank you. So maybe um, Commissioner Bell um, can help us to learn what they do in Wayne County or how, how they, they collect the data, um, who collects the data and where they get their funding to be able to do that. So I don't think we automatically, I mean, let's look again to see what's working Right. And maybe we can do that throughout the state. Um, so just a suggestion. I always like to, again, we say, don't reinvent the wheel. If Wayne County is doing it, um, I'm sure here, you know, and I don't know in my district, uh, that's something I need to ask if they're doing it. So if Wayne County is doing it, um, Southwest Michigan should be able to do it. So. I agree, and I think you're spot on with not recreating the will. If something is working, looking at best practices to move uh, throughout the um, the state, um, I'll brag and say how proud I am of what we do here in that respect. The Wayne County, we re received numerous awards from the National Association of Counties on how we uh, go about our juvenile justice system. So, um, you know, not every uh, program works for every county. But you know what we have, we can certainly explore on how the rest of the state and the rest of the counties across the state can uh, utilize uh, the what works well for us. And and Senator Lasada, I will say, looking at the participants on this task force, many of these counties do collect data, and they do some level of data reporting. I think what we need to know is who's collecting what, to what extent are we collecting and reporting the data across the state. Um, so in addition to, to questions for, for Terry, I also wanted to give folks from SCAO and, and MDHHS an, an opportunity to provide any reactions or thoughts um, to add on to Terry's overview, given that those agencies um, do have a you know, responsibility or, or have the, a lot of the data kind of under their, their systems. Um, and then also turn it over to, to Tom to talk a little bit about SCAO's working group. Um, at the last meeting that, that I participated in, the conversation centered around data analysis, some of the challenges, limitations, as well as the fears um, that, that county level folks might have um, to collecting more data, um, getting to that incentives question, I think that, that Judge Allen uh, raised. Um, so I'll turn it over, I don't know, uh, Tanya, Noah, um, others, uh, I can't see everybody on my screen at this point um, who, are, who are here from SCAO, if you wanna provide any uh, high level reactions, thoughts, 
then I'll also turn it over to uh, to Derek as well. Uh, sure, I can just kind of um, touch base on that. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, great presentation, Terry, and we've worked with uh, Terry and Joe on a variety of things. Um, you know, I don't think that Terry's uh, presentation is a surprise to most people on this call and those that have been around um, juvenile data for a, for a while. Um, one thing that really sticks out to, to me and one of the things that we have a challenge, not just with juvenile data, but, you know, with, with lots of data, um, we kind of joke internally that there's, you know, 83 different flavors of, of everything, right? And so that becomes a challenge. Um, particularly when we're talking about juvenile things, I, I learned early on to, to stop and check for meaning because um, we often talk past each other because we have um, different interpretations or things like that. And so that's been a little bit of a challenge um, over the years that, that we've been working towards. And so I think that's critical to make sure that we're talking apples to apples as we move forward um, on that. And so, um, you know, I, I think one of the biggest challenges over the years um, obviously has been um, just kind of, I think, larger system um, issues in terms of focus. I think there has been significant, um, you know, advancement in the area of child welfare because, you know, there is significant federal um, investment and, and attention in, in those areas. And I think sometimes that overshadows juvenile justice sometimes and just kind of a natural thing. And so we've built out a lot of things for, for child welfare um, due to federal requirements and things like that. And so I think, you know, over the years, uh, you know, particularly recently, um, I have seen an increased, you know, interest and investment in, in juvenile justice area internally, which I've been excited about. Um, but obviously we have some of those challenges. Um, and I think the more that we have, you know, this group and, and folks to be able to talk about and, and sit down um, for that data discussion, it will help. Um, you know, I have also seen, you know, at a local level, um, more interest, um, participation, and willingness to be vulnerable with, with the data, right? And so that's, we had some discussion recently about, um, you know, fears around use of, of data, um, and, and that requires people being vulnerable to be able to share that. And so I, I see that willingness going on. So I'm very excited about, um, you know, the future of, of juvenile justice data and what we can accomplish, particularly with the momentum of this group. Um, but we've definitely had some challenges, um, you know, some of the local level of, you know, just making sure that we have staff that understand the data systems and are using it right. And um, even if you have the software, you know, there becomes a fidelity issue, right? So are people putting in the information correctly? You know, it's the whole garbage in, garbage out issue. So I think that is, you know, a, a huge thing to tackle across the state to make sure people have um, that. But, um, but those are just kind of a couple of my high level um, things. I don't know if, uh, Justice Clement is, is on here. I don't know if she has anything to add from her perspective. Um, but. Justice, anything you wanted to add to that? No, I, I think Noah did a, a great job um, summarizing that. And I, and I just echo um, the appreciation for Terry providing um, that oversight that I, I um, that overview that I think most people on here, and this, these are the conversations that we've been having for, for years. Um, so I'm just, I'm glad that the entire task force is hearing this. And as we move forward, that, that um, we'll be able to focus on some of these key questions that, um, that, Terry, that Terry has uh, summarized for us. Derek, any thoughts, reactions from MDHHS? Yes, good morning to all. Um, first and foremost, Terry, excellent job, um, great information. Very much appreciated. Uh, Terry sat in the seat that I that I sit in now for some time, and so I have great admiration for the work that she's done to lay down some of the foundations here. Um, we, as a department, are very much interested in the collaboration with the counties. There's a lot of great work going on around the state. Um, I've talked to a number of people around information that they are collecting. So, without rehashing all the points, I think Terry did an excellent job of hitting what we need to do and how we need to work together collaboratively to be uh, successful. Um, but she's absolutely correct. The information uh, in the data, the, the, the data information that's collected is instrumental in the seat that I sit in, in terms of being able to uh, articulate um, with a reasonable degree of understanding of, of what, uh, where kids are in the state, what their charges are, what racial disparities are there? There are so many factors that contribute to 
information that, that we need to know uh, in the department on a daily basis that's not there readily. So we're very much interested in working with uh, the task force moving forward in this work and appreciative of, of all the work CSG's done so far. And um, just again, looking forward to seeing improvements in this area. So whatever we can do, we will contribute. Great, um, and, and Tom, um, I don't know if you wanna provide just a kind of high level overview of, of some of the comments um, and questions um, or thoughts around data collection that were raised at the last SCAO meeting, but I thought that was a really good mapping exercise that you all led to try and better understand the challenges and limitations as well as the fears and, and, and what people would hope to get out of more data um, in the juvenile justice system. Yeah, thanks, Nina. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, just to piggyback off of what Noah was saying, uh, first, kudos to Noah and Tanya. They really facilitate and keep us moving in our scale work group that was commissioned by Justice Clement and her desire to see local courts, administrators, and judges work closely together to uh, look at the task force as a whole um, and data being one of those subject matters. So thank you to the three of you for your leadership and bringing us together to, to work on this at a local level. Uh, I would say that our group is um, very interested in the conversation about data. I mean, some of the folks that are on the call uh, today, even Judge Allen, uh, Senator Lozada from the Southwest, uh, folks like Alvin Gonzalez, they're already collecting great micro and macro level data. Um, and so piggybacking off on some of the commissioners, not reinventing the wheel. Um, there are some people doing some good work that can be looked at and viewed. It just needs to be coordinated in a way that we're all doing it the same way with the same systems, with the same clarity of what's expected from it. Um, you know, we're all interested in being driven by data as long as it produces great outcomes for our kids and families um, and supports the work our staff are doing. Uh, that involves funding, that involves systems. And again, that involves a lot of the things Terry's talked about uh, through Vision 2020 and the work they've tried to do with the data dictionary and providing an avenue to understand how apples can be compared to apples and not oranges. And so I think those are, those are some of the things that we hear in our group, our scale group, and that is our fears are that the data is misrepresented sometimes out there. Um, that there are courts doing very good work, that one case doesn't mean the whole state's on fire. And that there are people, if you talk to them, that are collecting and working with people that are mining data that can tell you exactly what kids are doing in their systems. Is it consistent across the state? No, it's not. But when you have a decentralized system, you're left to do things at a local level through funding units that maybe not provide the level of information or support that's equitable across the state, you're asking for things not to be um, comparable. And so our, our fears are just that, that funding can be part of something that makes us all unified in a way that data can be consistently put in and brought out in a way that demonstrates the effectiveness and the efficiencies of our systems. Um, I think the other things are just um, the use of data. How will it be used? When will it be used? Um, so having clarity, not just around the definitions of data is like, what is the definition of recidivism? I mean, it can be measured in about 37 different ways, but also the clarity in which you want to use that data publicly. And what will that mean to local courts and the measurement against others? Or will that be the case? And so I agree, we need to be vulnerable. We need to be open. Uh, I think the Lieutenant Governor said it best. Um, we need to think big. We need to think differently. Um, and we also just need to look inside and see if there's people already doing the work. You know, like I said, there are people doing it, but um, I think it's, it's really making sure there's equity in our systems, making sure there's clarity in, in what you want out of systems. Our, our group has done a nice job, I think, so far of trying to figure out what the questions are. You know, um, what are you trying to answer with this data? And we want to help answer those questions ourselves so that we can give you a good picture of what we're doing. And so um, from systems to funding, to equity and in, in comparisons to, um, I think just the way data has been used um, in the last few years are the biggest concerns for our group, Nina. But I would tell you, our group is very open. Um, I think we're challenged to think differently and, and that comes from Justice Clement. 
and some of the other vocal people on the call, like Judge Allen, who has done tremendous work in this area for a lot of years, that we know the value of this to our, 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 our public and, and you folks that help fund us. We know how important this it is. We just need to be in the room to help you get it right. And I think that's what our scale work group is trying to do. We're trying to be proactive about coming to the table with uh, what we've done historically, what we're trying to do now, and definitely where we wanna go in the future. Thanks, Tom. And, and yeah, one thing that stood out to me in that conversation and, and that you alluded to was um, kind of the reasons for, for using data, right? Everybody always thinks about the negative, you know, reasons that, that data might be collected, right? To hold people accountable, to, to, to be punitive in terms of funding and, and so forth, but really thinking about what are the positive uses of data? Why do we need to use data and how it could benefit local leaders, how could it, how could we incentivize local leaders? What are the positive ways that data can be used and not frame it from a, from a negative perspective, um, which is, I know, a fear and a, and a real fear um, that, that folks have. So I think that was one of the things that I, that I took away from that group. I don't know if Judge Allen or Justice Clement, um, folks from SCAO, anything else from the last working group that you would want to share and, and make sure the task force knows from the local perspective? Well, I mean, I, I can say unequivocally that I've um, it's been a priority to track things locally um, at the county level, um, at the probate court, family court level. And I view it as a huge asset um, when I am uh, collaborating um, with the board of commissioners and law enforcement, the schools, and I, I, I think that is um, something that needs to be taken forward as far as being able to um, control the narrative is the way that it's been put in the past. And so when you get the data, that's a part of the transparency of the court system and a part of being able to um, leverage public knowledge on the system and what needs to happen because it's not perfect, it's all changing. We have good examples of that recently with COVID and with uh, Raise the Age and it's just an ever evolving uh, issue. So every year is, is, is an opportunity to inform. Great. Any other thoughts, reactions um, in terms of data challenges, limitations from where you all sit um, in your different roles um, in communities, um, in, in the courts, um, or any other questions for, for Terry as well? Jason? Yeah, I just wanna say thanks to everyone who shared and, and, and uh, Terry's great overview. I obviously uh, support um, having more robust, accurate statewide data as an advocate. I, I do believe that uh, as taxpayer funded institutions that serve people that, that, that uh, engage with children, uh, as much data needs to be as public as possible. Um, uh, there is an accountability and an oversight piece that, that is included here. Um, you know, I just had a, a conversation with a reporter yesterday who's, who's doing a story on the issue of the lack of psychiatric beds and how that impacts uh, uh, young people who may uh, languish in detention and ER rooms because there's no alternative for them. And she said, you know, it's, she was really feeling hamstrung by not knowing the simple question of how many kids are in the system. Uh, what's the length of stay of kids that could be placed in alternative placement? So beyond the concern of, uh, in which I understand that, that there's I think you froze, Jason. Just making sure it's not my computer. Okay. Um, there's, there's this concern of. We'll hopefully get Jason back and maybe he can finish his, his comment um, while waiting for him. And, and uh, I know Cole put a question in the chat as well. Um, will we be exploring data, how data is collected as it relates to data driven tools, especially when we think about human bias and, and algorithms and yeah, that's always a, a conversation that we want to have is 
how are decisions being made and how is data being collected around those decisions? So whether we're talking about risk assessments or other um, decision-making tools that are used at different points along the juvenile justice continuum, it's, it's really important to think about what data is collected on the use of those tools, the results of those tools, how decisions are being made and how all of that uh, differs or looks for different populations of young people, dem different demographics, et cetera. And so, yes, I think that'll be part of the conversation around um, indicators and performance measures and, and so forth. Um, I don't see Jason back. I'm back. Yeah, sorry. Uh, okay. I didn't cut out for a while. There you go. Go ahead. All right. And, and doing a rant too, you know? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that, that was it. I just, you know, I, I, I want uh, uh, to support like advancement of data as much as possible, just with the goal of, of understanding that it, it should be. And I hope that the other state examples show how it can be done effectively, uh, provides the context that the, the, that the court stakeholders want, but also makes it as much uh, public and transparent as possible while protecting uh, the confidentiality of the kids. Any other reactions, questions for Terry? Okay, Terry, thank you so much. That was a super helpful overview. As I mentioned, we are in constant communication with Terry and, and wanna make sure our work and, and her work is aligned. Obviously the historical knowledge um, and, and just day-to-day -day experience um, that Terry has with the juvenile justice system and with data um, is invaluable and, and um, goes way beyond um, what we've, you know, what we have been able to learn in, in a short period of time. So thank you, uh, Terry, so much for that overview. You're welcome. Thanks for inviting me. I'm always willing to help. Um, I'm here, you know how to find me. I did want to add one thing, Nina, to what Cole uh, asked about. There uh, are some very important studies out of MIT and also Stanford about biases that are built into algorithm and risk assessments, and I'm sure you'll be covering that. Great. Yeah, we'll, we'll try and share as many resources as we can, and we will we'll post those also. Um, the task force has a website on MCJJ where we're going to post some, some background material. So yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll connect with you to make sure we have the right studies. Great. Um, so in the next uh, part of the meeting, we wanted to take some time to prep for the next two task force meetings where we'll present findings from our data analysis and, and try and set some expectations in terms of what data we've been able to access, um, what have been some of the limitations and challenges kind of building off of what Terry and others have already described. Um, what are the key questions that we think we'll be able to answer given the data that we have um, access to and has been made available? Um, and then also share some examples from other states that can be used by the working group and the task force to think about some of the questions that, that we've already started discussing um, in terms of next steps for data collection in, in Michigan. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen um, and make sure that folks can see that. Someone give me a yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so first, just to talk a little bit about what our goal is um, or what our goal was uh, for the data analysis for this assessment. Um, and, and I'm gonna go through the various data sources that we've been able to access and the data that we have available to us as well as the key questions. But I do wanna echo also what the Lieutenant Governor said in the beginning of the meeting in that um, you know, while there are limitations, while there is a lot more data that we would have liked to be able to analyze, um, and, and haven't been able to for a variety of reasons, that this is still the most comprehensive analysis of, of Michigan's uh, juvenile justice system from a statewide perspective um, that's been conducted. And we do think that there is a lot of very helpful, useful information that we can glean from this assessment, um, not just from the data analysis, but the qualitative as well, the focus groups and interviews with, with hundreds of stakeholders um, that we've been talking to over the last several months. Um, so the goal of the juvenile justice data analysis was to collect and analyze juvenile justice data from across the state to try and observe system trends um, over a period of five years, um, what's been happening in the juvenile justice system, what happens to youth as they move through the system um, at various decision points um, when they first come into contact, 
And then at all the different points along the continuum, whether that's um, petitions being filed, diversion, adjudication, disposition, sentencing, et cetera. And then try and show the variation that might exist at each of those decision points across race and ethnicity, gender, um, and geography. Um, the other big goal was to be able to answer some key questions about how the juvenile justice system in Michigan is aligned with the research on what we know works to improve youth outcomes. Um, where are there um, misalignment? Where are things going well? What is working well that can be scaled up, um, et cetera? So we were hoping to answer some of those key questions that I'll, I'll talk about in a little bit. And lastly, building off of what Terry and others just mentioned, um, and we spent a good, good time talking through, is to identify or uncover gaps in data, challenges and limitations in data collection, data sharing and reporting, so that the task force can come up with recommendations to strengthen data infrastructure and statewide data collection. Um, so through our data collection efforts, um, what data have we been able to obtain from the various state and local data sources? And what are the key questions that we'll be able to answer in our assessment findings? Um, so in this slide and the next slide, we tried to provide a high level overview of the various data that we had available to us or have available to us currently to analyze for this assessment. And you can see from these slides that there are definitely gaps or holes that exist for a number of reasons. Um, and I also want to recognize that we have three of our three of my colleagues on this uh, call as well, uh, Becky, Emily, and Andrew, who are from our research division. And so I may call on them because I am definitely not the data um, nerd in the group by any means or the data whiz. Um, so I may may call on them to expand on this since they've been the one working within the data, um, working with state and local agencies to get access to and better understand the data. Um, so you can see most notably that we do not have any a lot of data on the front end of the juvenile justice system in terms of arrests, in terms of referrals to the juvenile justice system, and very limited data on diversion. We have data around consent calendar um, uh, information, but we do not have access to diversion that might happen at the law enforcement level or uh, pre-consent uh, calendar um, diversion. We do have some data on detention um, and through the courts, we do have data on adjudication, some data on dispositions, youth's offense um, in terms of whether it's a, a, a new offense or a violation, um, offenses for disposition. And we do have access to some information on youth's prior uh, referral or adjudication history. Um, Another big gap uh, that we, uh, in terms of what we don't have uh, to be able to analyze for this assessment is a lack of data on youth that are on community supervision. We don't have access to probation case management systems at the local level that um, have a lot of this kind of data in terms of uh, supervision levels, program services, and what outcomes look like for youth on community supervision. Um, we do have data on youth in placement um, youth that are committed um, to MDHHS, including how long they are in placement, what facilities they're in, the, by, you know, facility type. Um, we have some data around incidents um, that happen in facilities, as well as the reason that youth are discharged and how they're discharged from placement. Um, and we don't have data around reentry um, in terms of uh, services and, um, and uh, time um, information. Um, again, while there are significant gaps, and I'm going to go through each of these data sources in a little bit more detail, and in each presentation that we do for the task force in the next two meetings, we're going to provide a lot more contextual um, information about um, the exact measures um, that were available to us. Um, but we do have confidence that the data that we do have will be able to shed light on, on what is happening in the system, where there are opportunities for improvement, where things are working well. Um, and again, it's important to, to note that the qualitative information that we've been able to gather will, will be super helpful um, in, in helping think through recommendations. 
Um, so some of the data challenges um, that we've experienced in trying to access this case level data, I don't think is much different from what has already been discussed, but um, availability. So certain data elements that are either not available in the data sources that we were able to access, or they were not easily extractable from the state and local data systems. Um, completeness in data, there uh, are missing or incomplete data fields um, that can create gaps in what we can learn from the data. Um, standardization, I know we talked about this a lot, um, that data definitions across systems are not necessarily standardized and the way that one jurisdiction may define something is different than another jurisdiction. So that can make the aggregation of data as well as comparing data um, across the data systems um, challenging and difficult. Um, and then linkability, that there aren't any um, unique identifiers that can link youth across different parts of the system. So from one data source or data system to another to be able to follow a young person completely through their path or continuum <clears throat> in the juvenile justice system. Um, so going into a little bit more detail, we wanted to share what uh, the key questions are that we feel like we'll be able to answer um, based on the data that we received. Um, so the next couple of slides will show the data sources, um, a little bit more description about the data and then the key questions. So we have been able to access data from the Judicial Data Warehouse, the JDW system um, that SCAO has. Um, we've been able to, to get uh, 2017 through 2019 case level data for pro formally processed cases. Um, this is statewide data. We've also been able to access local county court data from 32 counties that represent about 55% of the state's juvenile justice population. Um, this includes a range of different counties um, from you know, rural, suburban, urban, um, large, small, um, different regions of the state. So we do think that this is fairly representative. Obviously it's, it's, it would be nice to have um, more uh, local data, but we do think that it's, it's fairly representative of the population. Um, and we have data from 2015 to 2020, case level data on petitioned cases. And then we also have data from the Michigan State Police, um, five years of data on juvenile adjudications and subsequent adult charges. Um, and again, as we present findings from, from these data sources in our next two presentations, we'll go into uh, greater detail in terms of the caveats um, and, and where there were missing data fields or things that we couldn't um, tell necessarily because of the limitations in each of those systems. Um, so in terms of the key questions based on these three data sources, what will we be able to answer in our presentation? Um, so we'll be able to answer uh, questions around um, how many cases were adjudicated statewide um, over a, a few year period of time, um, how many youth were re-adjudicated re during that time period, and how were these adjudications distributed um, across youth demographics by race, ethnicity, gender, um, by geography, different um, locales across the state, and was there any variation by offense level? So what did adjudications look like at a statewide, um, from a statewide lens? Um, from the county court data, we'll be able to look at how many cases were petitioned and diverted, placed on consent calendar, adjudicated, disposed to uh, supervision, placement or commitment to DHHS during the study period. Again, we have five years of data from the county court uh, data source. Um, we'll also be able to uh, look at how cases move through the court system from petition to adjudication. Um, we'll be able to look at some disposition and sentencing um, around cases and how, how they end up, depending on uh, if that data is available for, for certain cases. Um, we'll be able to look at some variation, um, looking at different um, uh, uh, disaggregated uh, uh, populations, um, looking at demographics, geography, offense level, um, looking at how uh, these different um, decision points, petitions, diversion, consent, dispositions, et cetera, varied by whether it was a new offense or a technical violation. Um, and again, to what extent are these systems trends lining up with what we know from research and best practice? Um, and then from the Michigan State Police data, we'll be able to tell how many youth in that particular data set 
experience a re-adjudication or conviction in the adult system within one, two, and three years. And we'll, we'll go into more detail, but that particular data source will only be able to look at adjudications, and those are for kids that are committing more serious offenses. Um, in terms of placement and commitment data, we have data from MDHHS. Um, we have five years of statewide case level data on youth that are placed in residential facilities that are under the supervision of the Department of Health and Human Services, both dual status and juvenile delinquency. Um, and we also have access to, to aggregate licensing and, and incident violations. We have placement data from 11 county court systems um, that represents about 40% of the state juvenile population. Um, again, here we have five years of case level data on youth that are placed in residential facilities under the supervision of the court. Um, so some key questions that we'll be able to answer around placement and commitment. Um, what is the risk offense history, demographic profiles of youth that are in residential placement under state and under court supervision? How long are youth um, staying in residential placement? How does that vary by different demographics, by risk level, by offense history and offense type? How often are young people moving in and out of placements during the time period that they're under supervision? Um, and for MDHHS, um, we are able to look at incidents. Um, what are the most reported incidents um, that take place in placement facilities, serving youth that are supervised by the state? How do incidents get reported? How does that vary by facility type and by youth um, demographics? Um, so I'll, I'll stop there um, and I want to pause and just see if, um, you know, Becky, Emily, Andrew, who have been working with the data um, have anything to add. And, and I do want to say that, you know, we want to thank everyone um, in all of those systems that has been working with us over the last several months to help us uh, complete data sharing agreements, get access to data, extract the data, answer all of our questions in the back and forth. Um, people have been super responsive and helpful um, in, in getting us accessibility to that level of data. Um, so we'll be able to analyze it for the presentations. But anything, Becky, Emily, Andrew, that you want to add? Um, and, and then I'll turn it over to, to see if folks have questions. Um, Nina, you did. A great job representing what we have um, and what we plan to do with it. Um, one thing I'll say is that in the section where you talked about uh, what data elements we have access to and what we don't, I want to just make it clear that we're not saying that those other data points don't exist and they aren't being used um, at the local or even state level. Um, it's uh, a matter of us accessing those data. Um, there were barriers to access uh, for various reasons. Um, so, so yeah, um, we're going to do the, the best, the most that we can, the best that we can um, with those data elements, primarily from um, courts and MDHHS. Um, yeah, we're going to do the best that we can. We're excited to start sharing, sharing findings in upcoming presentations. Any questions that people have? And, and again, we're gonna go into higher level detail when we present findings. Um, our, our presentation in February will focus um, first on the deep end. So looking at placement and commitment and then our presentation in March will focus on um, the beginning or the front end of the juvenile justice system through court processing and, and so forth. Um, and so we're gonna, we're gonna parse it out in that way so that we can have concrete conversations in, in each of those areas. Um, Judge Allen, Justice Clement, Commissioner Webster. Um, Judge Allen, do you wanna go first? You had percentages of juvenile populations in a, in a couple of the categories. And in, 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 it said juveniles, and then you had added juvenile justice. So I'm curious whether the numbers are juvenile, percentage of juvenile justice, populations or the juveniles, which we do know how many juveniles are in each county. So it's, um, sorry, it, it yeah, makes a difference in how you interpret that. I, I misspoke. It's the, the ju state juvenile population. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I just needed the clarification. Thanks. Yep. Justice Clement. Well, I just want to clarify, I, and I wrote a, a couple of them down, the, the key questions 
Um, I saw it broken down by JDW, county court data, and MSP. And I think Rebecca might have just touched on this, but just for clarification, what you have to report on that might not be complete because in all of those systems, you don't have all of the information from a, a, across the state, correct? That's right. Um, okay. JDW uh, covers most of the state. Uh, the county courts, I, I think, um, we have 50, like about just over 50% of the state juvenile population covered. Um, and MSP, it's sort of depending on what's being reported from where. I'm not entirely sure of the county coverage on that, um, but we sort of have what's available in MSP. And so when, when you guys are doing those reports over the next um, several meetings, that information will be shared. Um, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that when when we're sharing data from the JDW, that we're making sure that we're qualifying what is there, what is not there, what's validated, what's not validated, just to make sure that 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 the data work group that's moving forward doesn't think that we have you know statewide data from 2017 to 2019 that show how many cases were adjudicated statewide, and that they think that that is the you know the the validated numbers. And that's just an example. That, yeah, my, that that's a that's a great point. And um, yeah, we will definitely qualify all of our findings with what is included, what is not included, and how um, whatever is missing and what the implications are for whatever is missing for how we can interpret um, those findings. Great. Thank you so much. Commissioner Webster. So I, I apologize if this was already answered because I was interrupted a couple of times, but I think I heard that the, the data you have is primarily from 11 counties representing 40% of juveniles in the state. Is that, did I hear that? So I think you're referring to when we were looking at placement data. Mm -hmm. um, we have placement data from MDHHS on, on that's a statewide um, looking at supervision of kids and residential placement under the supervision of the state, um, under the supervision of MDHHS. And then we also have placement data from 11 county court systems that represent about 40% of the state's juvenile population. And so the MDHHS are, number is statewide? Yes. Okay. All right. Then I don't need to ask my question. Thank you. <laughs> it, well, just to clarify that, it, it's statewide for kids that are under the wardship of the state. It's not gonna be inclusive of all young people who are in the wardship of the state and, and counties. We will have access through the county specific data to a subpopulation based on the county data that we do, do have of kids under county wardship and placement. But so we will not be able to provide the full universe in a given year of all kids that are placed in either county or state wardship. Well, and my concern was, and so maybe I will sort of add, ask my question, is that if you have data from 40%, 11 counties, that means that's very large counties. I mean, those are urban counties. And just wondering um, how the more rural counties are going to be factored into that, because I think it will be quite different. Yeah. Um, so I, just curious about that. Yeah. And Becky, feel free to jump in, but I think we... We have most of the larger counties, but we have a fairly robust sample of smaller counties as well. Is that right, Becky? Yeah. Um, we the, So the 11 counties does include some large um, and then a smattering of like of medium and small. Um, these are the counties that use a specific data system in which placement information is tracked. Um, so, these are the only counties for which we could get um, placement information. Yeah, I, I think to your broader um, question, uh, Commissioner, and also Justice Clement's comments, um, it's why, as Nina mentioned, we are doing literally uh, hundreds of conversations with um, state and local leaders uh, uh, across all of Michigan. Um, because we knew, and I think all many of you knew going into this project, that the data was not going to be able to tell a complete story. I think importantly, what Nina said, which is 
Um, I, our hope and expectation is this will be the most data-driven assessment of Michigan's juvenile justice system ever conducted so that we will have more data and in some cases have a representative sample of data to be able to provide data trends, but because of the gaps, because um, we, we don't have full coverage of that data, we've been very intentional about making sure we get urban perspectives, rural perspectives, under-resourced, um, you know, uh, robust resource communities, different populations, different politics, different cultures, different dynamics, so that we can share as many of those perspectives as possible. Uh, and we will have a lot to say, and, and, and folks across Michigan, unsurprisingly, have had a lot to say about what's working well and what the gaps are. Um, the only other thing I'll, I'll say about this is, um, even though it's, it's obviously a challenge when you don't have the data, our experience in other states is that when you have enough conversations, and this has happened in Michigan, a lot of the same themes come up. And those qualitative themes often, um, where there is data, are a fairly good reflection of the story that the data would tell. Um, so um, we would certainly like to have a more complete data picture. Um, but I think between the data that we do have and the very robust qualitative findings, we will be able to tell a very strong, consistent, and kind of representative story about how Michigan's juvenile justice system is functioning. Thank you. And I think a lot of the concerns that you're raising are ones that we would hope the data working group and then the, you know, the recommendations of this task force um, would lend to in terms of strengthening or improving the data system by, by also identifying where there might be missing information, where data is, is, is challenging to extract, where things are not linked together. Um, I think that will, will help illuminate some of that as well. Any other questions? And, and again, as Becky said, and, and to um, the questions that were posed, as we present the data, for example, in February around placement or in uh, March around um, some of the court data, we're gonna make sure that we have, um, you know, explained all of the caveats in the data, um, the missing information, um, what implications we can't draw from the data because of certain information that's not available, um, what exactly is the data that we had and, and what can we, what information can we extract from that? So we'll, we'll make sure to include all of those details as we go through the data and, and before we present it. Um, Judge Allen. Well, it occurs to me, you're going to be giving um, the analysis of the data in meetings happening after today, but these subgroups are going to be meeting and cart before the horse, I'm wondering, if we don't have the data for the subgroups, how can we qualitatively move forward in these subgroups? And, and I, I agree with what the Lieutenant Governor is saying, you know, we need to take a look at the big picture, but if we don't have the big picture, how do we move forward? And we're not getting this information before the general meetings. So there's not an opportunity for us to parse it out um, before a meeting, so a general meeting. But I, I am very concerned that we have these subgroups going on and we don't have the data that we need <laughs> that you have been working very diligently on. I'm, I'm not saying anything other than you've been working diligently on and, and I, know it's, I know it's a maze. So um, I'm looking for why I shouldn't be discouraged about you know, the, the subgroups um, not having full information. Yeah, no, that's that's a great question. Um, so the intention is to have the working groups meet for a first time in February. Like you said, that is before any of the presentations come out around uh, the data findings or the qualitative analyses. What we always hope to do in those first meetings is, is set the groundwork. Um, so um, kind of talk through, and, and, and Josh can talk more about this because the, the finance working group already met for a first time. Um, but talk about roles. What is this working group really challenged to do? Um, go through some of the, the state examples, research, national best practices. Those are things that we don't need to wait for, for people to be able to digest and look at um, prior to getting Michigan specific data or information. I think it's, it, we always find that that first meeting is an opportunity to set the stage going forward. And then I think we can have more of those more robust conversations of the working groups 
in March, April, and May before the task force comes back together to think about recommendations. So that that's what we're thinking in terms of timeline, um, if that's helpful. Yeah, Judge to, to Allen, your, your question is exactly what the intention is, which is for those working groups to have the data, have the analysis, and to base their conversations and um, brainstorming about recommendations based on that analysis, not, not based necessarily on sort of preconceived notions of, of what's working and what's not. We're just getting an early start um, in particular because um, a number of those working group members will not be on, will not have come from the task force. Um, and so will not be as oriented to all of the research and the kind of the level setting and the expectations that we've been going over in these meetings. Um, so the expectation is to have an early meeting sometime in February, just to ground folks in the process and the charge, and as Nina said, the background research, um, and then to have the schedule of meetings based on the availability of the analysis and for folks to digest the analysis and come up with recommendations accordingly. So, so my understanding is the deadline on recommendations the, the first deadline, I'll call it, is, is in July of 2022. And it would seem to me the earlier we have the data that has been gathered, the better we will be able to develop those recommendations. Uh, so I, 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 that is just a, a, a point that I think is an important point for, I, I don't want to feel hamstrung in these uh, subgroups. No, I mean, uh, again, it's where we'll have initial meetings just to ground everyone in process, timeline, expectations, and, and research, but um, everyone will have access, at, starting with our February meeting, to the first set of analyses and can um, build their war work off okay. of that. Yeah. Okay. And, and the pace of the meetings after February, once we have the data and the information available that we can share with the working groups, we'll, we'll move... Um, more quickly in terms of the number of meetings and how frequently people, you know, the working groups get together to dive into the data. I think we're, we're really thinking about those conversations, like the meat of it, um, where they're reviewing the data and coming up with, with potential recommendations and vetting those recommendations would happen um, between March and, and May. Any other questions? Um, about process or, and, and in terms of how this information will be shared with the task force ahead of time, you know, we've, we've done this a couple different ways where we just present it the day of the meeting and then obviously share the presentation afterwards. We have shared the presentation ahead of time. Um, there are pros and cons to that, of course. Obviously, there are a bunch of data slides um, that a lot, have a lot of context behind them. Um, so, so going through the data slides sometimes without that context and those talking points that go along with each slide um, can be challenging, but some people like to see those ahead of time. So um, we can talk through that and, and see what, what folks would like um, and what would be most helpful. Any other questions about expectations or, or the data for February and March? The only other thing I'll say um, is we've really appreciated everyone's engagement with this process. Um, and now that's gonna ramp up a level even more. Um, the February and March meetings will be intensive, will be a lot of data coming your way, will be a lot of qualitative feedback um, coming your way. And then, you know, as John Allen was saying, really the charge is to take all of that data and all of that analysis to the working groups and, and come up with um, recommendations for consensus. Um, so just wanna emphasize the importance of those February and March meetings and, and making sure that you can attend if at all possible and really be actively engaged and asking questions. Um, because that should be the bedrock of the information that really does lead to, to system improvements. Okay. Um, so the last part of the, the discussion today, we just wanted to briefly go over some other state examples um, to help the task force and then the working groups think about how other states have addressed um, similar challenges and, and have, um, uh, adopted uh, improvements or strengthened their juvenile justice data collection systems. 
um, and we'll provide more details um, about these that as, as folks are interested, um, as well as connecting um, kind of peer to peer learning for folks um, that are interested in a particular state, we can share that with the working group as well and have those conversations more in depth. Um, so starting out by just uh, sharing some best practices and data collection. Um, and, and these are some best practices that have already been talked about. And there are best practices that these state examples that I'll go through have adopted um, in their, their data collection systems. Um, so having performance measures that are identified that include outputs that are aligned to the research in, in terms of what works, that um, uh, have equity measures or measure system disparities, um, and that are able to um, provide information about not just how the system is performing, but about youth outcomes and looking at youth outcomes beyond recidivism, but also in terms of positive youth outcomes. Having quality assurance practices, um, as Terry mentioned earlier, that make sure that data is complete, that there are um, uh, specific definitions that are standard in terms of um, the data measures that are consistent across the state so people are entering and looking at data in a similar way. That data collection is flexible, um, easily um, extractable, um, easy to look at and report. Information is regularly updated, um, continuously available. Uh, the data is analyzed by key variables and contextualized to make sure that it's meaningful that there is the ability to share data across systems, um, along with having security measures in place or practices in place to ensure the confidentiality um, of that data. Um, and then having staff um, at, at every level um, value and use data to be able to guide decision-making, um, to make improvements in the system, and having, as we said, that analytic capacity to be able to regularly look at data to help inform those decisions. Um, so, so just a, a couple examples. Um, first, in, in Pennsylvania, um, Pennsylvania is a state where the majority of the juvenile justice system is locally run. Um, the state uh, human services agency runs the correction system. Um, where the Pennsylvania Juvenile Court Judges Commission um, collects, compiles, analyzes juvenile justice data for the state. Um, the commission is mandated by statute to collect this juvenile justice data. It's also mandated to provide technical assistance to local court systems and others who are using the data system, um, and also uh, mandated to disseminate um, evidence-based practices. Um, the commission also produces annual reports, um, like an re annual recidivism report, um, as well as supporting research efforts um, that can utilize their data to evaluate the effectiveness of interventions and programs. Um, so through the commission, the state uses a, there's a statewide case management system to collect and report um, dispositional data and recidivism data from the locally run juvenile justice system. The system provides a continuous um, regularly updated feed of data at the state level from the locally run juvenile courts. Um, and the state uh, juvenile justice system enhancement strategy, which is the state strategic plan for juvenile justice improvement, um, incorporates data into the decision making process. So that strategy or that strategic plan is continuously updated. There's an oversight body that looks at that strategy and they use the data from this data system to guide decisions and to guide um, that strategic plan as they move forward. Um, in Texas, um, the Texas Juvenile Justice Department um, has a research and statistics division. Um, in Texas, um, it's a kind of a state locally run system. Local um, counties run probation. The state runs state corrections, but there's also locally run facilities. Um, the research and statistics division of the Juvenile Justice Department collects and maintains data on youth that are committed to state custody, as well as youth that are under probation supervision referred to juvenile courts. The data are shared from county run probation departments monthly um, through an extract of case level data from their own data systems. Um, each county has a dedicated data coordinator that's responsible for making sure that data is accurate, that they're submitting that, that data in a timely fashion to the state and that it's consistent with the requirements um, for reporting. The State Department um, monitors the quality of the data, produces various statistical reports, 
responds to public information requests and also provides analyses of the juvenile justice system um, to state level policymakers. Um, Washington State, um, Washington is mostly a locally run system as well. Um, there was an order established by the Supreme Court in Washington to designate the Washington State Center for Court Research um, as a research arm of the Administrative Office of the Courts. Um, that uh, state center maintains databases of, of data, um, including referrals with dispositional information, detention, um, and data on evidence-based programming for research and for statistical reporting. The data that is included in that um, is collected from multiple data systems and combined into a comprehensive record. Um, research and data staff have protocols for data collection, for how to clean um, that data, as well as for how to share that data and, and, and where and how um, that sharing should occur. Um, and the center also conducts research to evaluate or test the effectiveness of programs and interventions um, and to inform uh, the design of services for youth on probation based on what they know is effective from, from that research. Um, and then the last uh, state that we wanted to highlight was Iowa. Um, Iowa is slightly different in that it is mostly a state system under the state judiciary, but local jurisdictions do oversee detention. Um, they have a uh, data warehouse um, through the Division of Criminal and Juvenile Justice Planning and their state Department of Human Rights that's mandated by statute to be a clearinghouse for all juvenile justice data and to be able to provide data analyses to key decision makers. The data warehouse contains case level juvenile justice data on referrals and case processing decisions. Um, they produce statistical reports on various topics, um, all available on their website. Um, and they maintain a data dashboard um, on key decision points in the juvenile justice data, in the juvenile justice system that can be disaggregated by various factors, including location, um, demographics, et cetera. Um, the Iowa Court Information System extracts are regularly sent to the Department of Human Rights um, for inclusion in this data warehouse um, and updates to that data in the warehouse are made with each of those extracts that are sent. Um, so again, you can see a lot of the best practices that I mentioned that other folks talked about and that Terry referred to that are represented in each of these examples, um, having access to regular and consistent data collection, data that is easy to use, um, easily extractable, having data dedicated staff, data coordinators, analytics staff to be able to manage the data, look at the data, clean the data and analyze the data, providing technical assistance to local systems on how to do that um, data analytics, um, and also having regular reporting available um, you know, in real time as well as an annual basis on key outcome measures that can be shared with a variety of different stakeholders, including uh, to inform state policy. Um, so I'll, I'll stop sharing there. Um, I know that's very high level in terms of these, these state examples. There are others um, that we can share as well. Um, and, and we can obviously connect folks from the working group, folks on the task force, as we move forward with conversations on improving data collection, with uh, folks from each of those states to learn more about how they were able to um, implement or, or strengthen their data systems. Um, any, any questions from folks about, yep, Judge Allen. What does clean the data mean? I've never seen that phraseology before. Yes, and our staff use that a ton when they get access to state and local data. So I'll let, let them explain what that really means. Um, I, can, I can comment on data cleaning. So, um, it, it can mean creating sort of standard definitions and making sure that all the data brought into the system adheres to those definitions. So if there are, um, if, if there is any missingness or uh, logic errors, then you can, um, you can update the data with the correct information. So there needs to be a process of quality assurance that uh, involves looking at the data, checking for a standard uh, error check, and then and then updating the data to to, uh, to clean to correct that. And then 
once once that's been accomplished, there may be additional data cleaning. For example, when we get data, sometimes we need to um, look at a specific question. And so we'll uh, sometimes categorize data or um, uh, group it in order to answer a specific research question. So I think that would also fall under the data cleaning um, phrase. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts about the state examples? Okay. So again, we, we'll, we're gonna share uh, more about those examples as we get into the working group and thinking about recommendations um, and connecting with, with peers and other in, in those states. Um, but if there aren't any other questions or thoughts um, at this point, um, just in terms of next steps, I think as we already talked about with the working groups, and, and I've had a few people in the chat and over email um, in the duration of this meeting, um, send me a message that they're interested in participating on a working group. If you are interested, if you know of someone or would like to nominate someone, we are still in the process of confirming and, and finalizing those lists of participants for each of those working groups. Um, so please, do share that information with us. Um, we're gonna try and finalize that over the next week or so, and then um, reach out to those working groups to um, confirm and establish a first meeting date sometime in February. Um, the next task force meeting is on, I believe, February 28th, um, where I think we will take up the full three hours, unlike this meeting and the last meeting, where we'll actually walk the group through our key findings on uh, everything out of home placement, including the data that we talked about, as well as all the qualitative information that we've gathered from our focus groups and interviews on um, the use of out of home placement. Um, so we really hope that folks are able to participate in that meeting. It's really important to be able to see the data and, and hear kind of the commentary around that data. So would really, um, you know, encourage folks to be able to be present as much as they can for that meeting. Um, and then we can talk through if folks have uh, specific thoughts about sharing that presentation ahead of time. I don't think we have a problem in doing that. Again, I think there's just some, some pros and cons to, to doing that, but all of that will be made available um, during and after the meeting um, to everybody as well. And they'll be shared with, with the working groups at that time. Um, any additional thoughts uh, about data or going into that February meeting that folks wanted to raise before we close? Um, I'm not sure, I think the Lieutenant Governor may have had to sign off, um, but any, anyone else um, have anything that they'd like to say before we, we end for the day? Can you send around a list of the current working groups so that we can maybe have a little bit of time to reflect whether or not we'd like to, to sign up for one of them? Sure, yes, um, and we can send out just a brief, um, kind of paragraph description of each of them as well in terms of what topics or issues that we think that each of those groups will cover. That would be helpful, thank you. Sure. Great, well, thank you all so much for, for the discussion today. Thank you, Terry, for the overview and presentation. Um, and we will um, obviously be in touch with you all about the working groups and other things in the interim, but look forward to seeing everybody in February. Thank you all, take care.